Hi, Karen. Welcome to the Sisterhood. Hello. Glad it's to so be part. Good. Yeah, it's so good to have you. So for people who aren't familiar with you, tell them a little bit about your life. Well, I am research professor of English and Christianity and culture at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, just finishing up my first year there after teaching English for uh, 21 years at Liberty University. So I live uh, in uh, Central Virginia in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so besides teaching English and um, cultural engagement, I write books now and then. I write a lot of articles and I spend uh, far too much time on Twitter. <laughs> Well, you are known as the notorious, I mean, isn't it? Tell, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but <laughs> yes. Um, okay, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. You should speak to the Twitter situation. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Um, the notorious KSP, correct? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> as uh, a Twitter person myself, uh, Karen is one of my favorite people to follow. Absolutely filled with wisdom and grace. And I think one thing you do well, Karen, is you ask, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, <laughs> but you ask yourself, am I the right person to speak into this at this moment? I, I do feel like you don't, you don't speak into everything all the time, but when you do, you have a wonderful, wise perspective. And so I feel like you have really considered, do I have something to say? Yes, I do. And so I am going to say it. And, and that kind of pullback or holdback is unique in the Twitter world, I think, where sometimes people just vomit their thoughts. Um, but also when you speak, it is always this balance of grace and truth that is so lovely and refreshing. And that I'm really big into tone. I really appreciate your tone as you not only comment on things, but interact with people. So if anyone's on Twitter, I give a high recommendation to follow Karen. Well, thank you. I do have to say that um, I've learned a lot over the years <laughs> and um, Twitter has, um, I think we've seen in the past few years, it's just, um, it's, it's contributed a great deal to the degradation of our culture um, a lot. I mean, it really has. And uh, but, and so I've had to learn because, because truly as I, I appreciate the kind things you've said about me, but sarcasm is really my love language. <laughs> um, and so I've had to learn over the years um, to, to tone that down just simply because Twitter has become so toxic um, that I think that there's a greater need to counteract that toxic toxicity with, um, you know, with more grace and truth. And so I've, I've learned and I'm, it, it's a struggle and sometimes I make mistakes and, um, but, um, you know, I'm learning to, to use the medium better, I think, and to see it as the mission field that it really is. Mm -hmm. Well, we are in a series about faith and art, and we're so excited to talk to you about literature and how we can even use reading as an avenue for faith, which I think a lot of people don't think about. But talk to us first about where did your love of reading originate? Well, I just grew up loving reading. I mean, my mother read to all of us kids all the time, which, you know, I think, you know, many, many, not all children, but many um, children have that gift from their parents. Um, and for whatever reason, just books just took with me. And so I always had my nose in a book. I mean, this was, you know, <laughs> this was before social media and even before video games and all of those things. Uh, and we generally lived in the country and there wasn't a lot to do. So I just developed a, a vivid imagination, played a lot by myself um, and spent a lot of time in books. And so it was, they've just always been part of my life. And, and uh, so I just went on to major in English in college and get a PhD in English and teach English. So um, it's been a lifelong love affair. Yeah, and so, and you transitioned recently to teaching in a seminary, mm. and have you really taken all of that with you, and how has that transition been? Yeah, it, 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 
you know, it is really amazing to me. And I, when I stop and think about it, um, because, because part of my, part of my story is that growing up in a Christian home and loving books, um, I never really saw those two things going together or integrating. I just, and even just the life of, of the mind and, and academia, it wasn't until I was in my really finishing my PhD program that I, I came to this sort of um, crisis point where I knew I needed to integrate my Christian faith with my academic pursuits. And so I, I, cross that bridge and then just went on to teach English at the university level. But then to move to a seminary, as I recently did, it's just wonderful the way that God, you know, he's just so he's got a great sense of humor and a, a greater plan than we could ever come up with, that he is using my love of literature to directly support and equip the church. So it's an amazing thing. So I get to teach students who are um, in the college, which is associated with the seminary, but also to teach seminary students um, and to teach them literature. And um, I do think that literature is, you know, literature has everything. It's, a, it's psychology, it's theology, um, it's sociology, it's philosophy. Um, literature offers us everything that we need to learn about human beings and neighbors, our neighbors and, and God, I think. So it's really, it's just amazing to me that God did this. I'd love to hear how you incorporate it a little bit in your seminary courses. I can picture it kind of an English course at a Christian <laughs> school, sure. but within a seminary course, how, what does that look like? Well, the courses that I teach are, um, they're either the college, right now they're the college courses or they are courses that a seminary student can take um, as part of, you know, a part of their electives. And so the way that I've always taught literature, even just in a, you know, regular English program is to emphasize not only Christian worldview that we can, you know, read literature through, but also uh, the way that art and aesthetic experience can can help us to understand ourselves as human beings, as as human beings created in the image of God, and to understand better how to to relate to one another, because so much of what we understand and experience is aesthetic or it is sensory, um, and so one course in particular that I teach is a course in which the students are basically from the beginning of the course and they're all the readings that we do in the final paper that they have to write, they have to answer the question, what makes good literature good? Which is a really hard question. Um, you know, so it has to do with goodness and truth and beauty um, and how we understand those things because there, there is so much truth, goodness and beauty in the world, but there's also a lot that go, that, that, goes mitigates against truth goodness and beauty and oftentimes things that we don't even really think about we often settle for the mediocre literature or television shows or movies or whatever or, or any kind or decor um and so to think about what really is good true and beautiful is is i mean the those things point us to God. So to think about those things in any area um, is, is really a theological undertaking. So um, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I'm most excited about teaching the seminary students. Well, that's interesting because our series is called <laughs> The True and Beautiful, <laughs> and you just use those words. But I would, I would love to hear you answer that question. What does make good literature to you? <laughs> And what are some examples mm. of texts that you think embody that definition? Well, my starting point for answering that question, especially when talking with Christians, um, because we, we just tend, we've been trained in our sort of a contemporary American evangelical culture to think differently. Um, we've, we've been trained to think always or so much about like the message of something, like what is the moral message? What is the lesson? Um, what is the plot? Um, and we have been trained less in our contemporary society, not just Christians, but really everyone to think about the form. Um, and so a simple way of putting that is to, to 
you know, we, we think about what is being said or shown or written or spoken, um, but we don't often think about how it is said. And so literature is an art that uses words. That sounds really basic, but in the same way that painters use paint, writers use words. And so we really should be judging a work of literature, not only by you know, the story or what it communicates, but how well the writer uses words to capture that experience. And so this is the difference um, between literature and just sort of, you know, an entertaining mystery novel that's just kind of, you know, giving us a puzzle to, to solve. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But literature, when we pay attention to how a writer uses words to open up you know, an experience to convey a perspective, um, to just make a connection with the world that we might never have thought about before. I mean, language is so powerful just in our own lives. Um, and then to sort of see someone master that and use that well and skillfully in in creating some sort of an experience, um, that's what we should be judging about literature, not just what it says, but how it says it. Yeah, I think that's so true. I know in my own experience, when I read, when I read something that gives words to a feeling or an experience that I've had, it's a gift. I truly receive it as a gift. Like that person just put words to something that I couldn't describe before this moment. And exactly. that, that, oh, that just feels so special. And it's true. It's, it's, that's what makes it such an art form. Right. And, you know, and then this is important and good just as, as a human being to, to, you know, the power of language and putting words, using words to understand and express an experience. Um, but as Christians, even more so because we we adhere to a faith that is centered on the word it's a word centered faith now when we use that of course we're we're talking about the word of god we're talking about the bible and or jesus as as the word um and yet it's not just a coincidence that god reveals himself to us through the word there's something about language that is expressive of his nature and of our nature and being made in his image. And so there's just something about the word and words um, that is part of who God is and part of how he relates to us and part of how we can worship and him and understand him and understand ourselves. Yeah, it, it really is so complex and complete all at once where you think, oh my gosh, the living word. And yet here, and we have the power to use words too, mm -hmm. as we write them, as we tweet them, <laughs> however we use them, as we speak them, I mean, it speaks to the power of words. And really when you're talking about literature, this difference seems to be the difference between information and art. What yes. makes something different from just relaying information or an idea and makes it art? It's the way that it is packaged. And so in literature, it's packaged through how words are combined. And it, to me, it's fascinating. As a writer, I love studying how people put words together and how they emphasize something with just even punctuation mm -hmm. is, is really um, interesting. And I don't know if all of our listeners are as geeky as I am in that way, but I am so grateful that God made us this way and that he made words accessible to us. And it just is a gift. It's such a gift. It really is. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a big part of why I love literature and also see Twitter as an opportunity for us to really think about how how we use words because there's so much power even in a f in a few words in that format um and that power can be used can do so much good or do so much damage um it's really kind of a um 
a sort of a concentrated version of everything that we might be talking about with words. And I think that's probably why I'm, I use it so much and I'm so, uh, I find it so powerful because it's, it's very a, a word-based medium and you really have to sharpen your ability with words to use it well. And even the people who use it um, for ill are really still using it well. They're using that medium well. Mm -hmm. um, they understand its power, um, even if it's not for good. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> well, could, let's dive in a little bit to the classics. I would love to know how you feel that the classics, I mean, I just feel like a lot of people dread them. A lot of, uh, like if I, for example, say to my teenagers, let's read this together. I mean, they, that's, it's not, it's not something that they're excited about. And they'll say, well, I have to read that for school or why would I want to read that? Why should people read the classics? <laughs> well, first, let me say that, um, that, you know, I, when I, when I talk about the classics, I, I'm mainly thinking about, you know, the old classics, but there are, you know, there are works of liter works written by literary authors today that I think will be, will be classic someday. So there are modern classics and old classics. And, and so I would kind of put them all together into a category um, that again, uses language, you know, as we've kind of touched on here already, uses language in a way that is not just to convey the information, but language that is, you know, is evocative and resonant and layered um, and poetic even. I mean, so th that's a, you know, po poetic and poetry, those are words that probably scare a lot of people. Um, but um, we all love, we all love poetry because if you're putting, if you're listening in the car to your favorite radio station or Pandora station or whatever with your pop songs, um, if, if you're listening to Lady Gaga, you love poetry. Right. I, so like because even popular songs are using I mean, of course, they're accompanied by music, but they're using words. And what teenager doesn't like write the lyrics of their favorite song on their note, notebook paper or whatever. Um, so we all do really understand the power that poetic words have and the the allure. But when we're talking about classic literature, literary works, um, we are it, it's harder and challenging because we do so much reading today that is quick and fast whether it's a blog post or a tweet or a facebook post um, that we think all of our reading should be that way um, and so when we pick up a work of literature that is using language in a very artful way um, it's a challenge and we have to read it. We, in order to to actually read it well, or even just understand it, we actually have to read it in a way that is nothing like what we're used to reading every day. We have to slow down. We have to pay attention. We have to focus. We have to pause. We have to reflect. Um, and I want to say because because I because I know that people find it challenging. I want to say that as someone who grew up reading books, loving literature, and had my PhD in English before social media even came about, I want you all to know that my attention span is shorter. I find it harder to do this kind of reading now that I spend so much time on social media and on you know, reading screens. And so the struggle really is real. Um, so, you know, I, I want to affirm that our, our minds are so are shaped so differently today and our attention spans are so shortened. I truly understand how difficult it is because I, I've seen the change in myself. Um, and yet, as for all the reasons we were talking about reading, reading things that demand our attention, that strain our attention, our, you know, our attention spans and make us think and make us reflect. Um, and make us help us to experience the world through different perspectives and different eyes than 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 our own. Those are things that build our character and expand our imaginations and enlarge our empathy and increase our understanding of of other human beings and of the world around us. 
so they make it makes us better. <laughs> it does. And I think sometimes we forget the power of beautiful things mm. in this information age. Again, it gets to the information versus the artwork. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely relate to the lowered attention span. And I also an only was an only child who grew up with my nose in a book all day long, every day. I was the classic bookworm and uh, read a lot of the books that you recommend as a teenager, but I haven't gone back to them because now I'm focused on information. I want to know the latest take. And also I, I want it fast. Give me the fast food version. Mm -hmm. And so I can really appreciate that there is a challenge and also appreciate that it's good for me to work through that challenge. Exactly. So talk to us about the role that when, if we do decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to dive into some of these classics and into some of these beautiful works, and I'm going to take that challenge. How can people expect that they'll be rewarded for that in their even relationship to God and in their faith? Hmm. That is a good question. And I, and I want to, okay, so I do want to pick up on something that Alexandra just said in, in answering that, because it's such an important point, um, is, is sort of the, the time and investment that's required of the beautiful. Um, and, and it's not just, you know, you know, information is part of a larger sort of um, category of the useful, right? Like we want that information because it's useful. And that's another sort of strain that influences our culture today is this ut utility or utilitarianism, right? Anything that's useful. And we don't think, of, you know, we don't have a lot of room for the things that just serve no purpose other than to be beautiful and to, delight us. Um, and so we are so, you know, we're so busy and we're so we're doing so many things and so many things have to be done that it's really, we just need to do the practical things. Even sometimes when we exercise or do something that you, we know is good for us, it's like something that we check off our list because, oh, well, I have to do this because, you know, this is necessary, um, you know, for, um, everything else that I'm doing. I can't do, you know, I can't do my job and perform my functions well if I, if I don't do this also. So to begin with, to just really, to step back and say, you know, um, I'm going to read this work or, or go to this museum or, you know, look at this painting simply because I want to appreciate beauty, like to recognize, to just say, this is not going to be fast. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to produce something effective and useful in my life. That's, you know, measurable in the next week or month. Um, and so just to begin and say, I'm not reading this because I'm going to get information. I'm not reading this because, um, because I'm going to, you know, take a test, um, which, you know, is what, you know, most of us in, in our younger years, that's why we're reading these things. And, um, and to realize it will be challenging and you need to read it slowly. I mean, even if, if you pick up a difficult novel and read 15 minutes of it a day, um, you know, you'll get through it at some point, you'll have read a great novel, and it will be so worth it. And by the way, I also want to say if you pick up a novel that you have heard is great, and you start reading it, and after a while, it's just not, you know, it, it's, you're not, you're not clicking with it, put it down and get another one, because there are so many out there, pick one that you, you know, you can really, that you really feel like you're enjoying. Um, and, um, you know, read slowly and attentively, uh, and, and just sort of chip away at it. Um, and of course, this is why, you know, I've just, I've produced this series of, of classics that I've edited, because I've, you know, for people, I mean, for people who already love these works, but especially for people who just kind of want to be introduced to them, and, and maybe um, don't know where to begin. That's why I've, I've produced a series for them. Can you talk a little bit about about that and what that looks like if someone orders this new tell us about how you've adapted them hmm. 
So I've um, this is a series um, published by B and H Publishing, um, and right now there are four uh, four classic novels that I've picked, and two more will come out next year. Um, and they're just ones that I love. They also are ones that are in the public domain, which means that there are no copyright issues. And so all that I've done, I mean, these editions include the original novels, um, and I've I've um, lightly edited them and put footnotes in for word you know words that are um you know that you wouldn't that are old or archaic or places or other names that wouldn't be familiar so you can just kind of glance down at the bottom of the page and, and know what they are and that um eases the reading but i've included um introductions um to these classics that give background information about sort of the con the literary and historical context for uh, the novels as well as the author uh, with no spoilers in them because it's just you know a lot of these introductions to the to the works that you can pick up at bookstores um, you know they, they all, they're often written by literary critics who want to analyze everything in the beginning and then if you read them you find out what happens and that's no fun if you're reading for the first time so I've just you know I point out themes and um and context for the works and then um I have discussion questions after each um major section and at the end um uh, and that's where I deal with kind of the events that happen and and help readers think through what the significance and meaning is so in a sense every one of these books is like Kind of like taking a, a class with me on the book because um, I draw on all my classroom experience and teaching them. Are you, can you reveal what those are? Which ones are in? Oh, yeah. So the ones the ones that are already out um, uh, are uh, Jane Eyre uh, by Charlotte Bronte was just released in March, along with Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And then last year uh, was Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen and Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. And the ones that I'll be working on this summer to come out next year will be um, Tess of the Durbervilles by Thomas Hardy and The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, and these, you know, these are just your standard classic works of literature, only six of them, um, but they're ones that, that I love, but also I chose ones that I think really um, do have a particular um, relevance to us today. Um, so for example, you know, I knew I would pick one by Jane Austen because Jane Austen is amazing. Um, and, but I picked Sense and Sensibility. It's not her best novel. Um, they're all wonderful. It's, you know, but I don't think it's her best one. But I think it's actually one that is most helpful to us today because, because the words sense and sensibility actually are, are pretty similar to what we would call today reason and emotion. And I, I think, think that today in, in the culture, in the church, we're really divided about like we have people who really emphasize reason and rationality and you know and and just thinking things through apart from emotion and we have people who are emphasize emotion and don't emphasize reason enough and this isn't really a spoiler but the whole um point of Austin's story is to show how we need both and that a person each of you know even if we, most of us tend toward one or the other, uh, most of us tend toward being emotional or being rational. And Austin shows, you know, that that's okay. We can be who we are, but we, we can't deny one aspect of our entire humanity or we will, you know, we will suffer and other people will suffer. So that's why I chose that novel. That's so great. I love it. It's inspiring. It's inspiring me to go back to the classics. <laughs> and I really do love English literature. I was an English literature major in college. That's actually what I chose. So I'm, I'm with you. So I, would, I do want to go back to this gospel perspective and how the classics in particular draw out a gospel perspective that maybe will be add some fresh light onto um, just the faith story. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about all great stories is that all great stories follow the pattern of the one true story, which is creation, fall, and redemption. Um, I mean, you really don't have a story if you don't have something that follows along that pattern. And an interesting pattern alongside that in any novel is that you could 
I mean, there are probably exceptions, but I don't think that there really is anyone that doesn't feature a character who is in pursuit of something that he or she wants, but in the process has to discover that what he or she wants is not necessarily what he or she needs. And that's really the story of our, all of our lives, isn't it? Like we think we need, want some, you know, we think this is what we need and we find out, oh no, this is what I really needed. And so my, I like to, um, I mean, I, to me, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte is one of the most gospel filled novels that there is. And a lot of people who haven't read it or just only were forced to read it in high school um, don't realize what a Christian novel it is because because Jane Eyre is fully human in the sense that she is she has desires and passions and needs love and she's lonely and alienated um, and none of us wants that and yet when she the temptations that she faces she faces several temptations um, to do wrong things but also she faces temptations to do the right thing for the wrong reason and man, oh man, is that, that, so I think that's something that we as Christians especially struggle with. Um, there are so many right things we could do, but if we do them for the wrong reason or they are wrong for us to do, um, then, you know, then it, it, we get it all wrong. And so um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of these novels are just, you know, they're retelling that same story over and over in different ways um, about, you know, some fall that we have and how to get back to redemption and whether it's our, you know, our family relationships or our romantic relationships. Um, ultimately, God has has created us for a purpose and um, and these classic works of literature just kind of echo uh, in all in a variety of ways, this same kind of story. It's almost as if it's giving us some context and texture to the lesson of the book, which you just kind of told us, um, as far as presenting it in a different way. Mm -hmm. How would you say we absorb stories that are told this way in a different way than we absorb the information that we all know, mm. for example, we need mm. both reason and emotion. Right. And we, we, we just right. talked about that, but, right. but right. the story presents itself in a different way. How do we as readers then absorb that truth mm. in a different way because we're reading it through a story? That that's such a great question. And that really that gets to the heart of why why read a work of a story that tells us this rather than just read an essay or a textbook or hear a sermon about it. Uh, and there's actually, I mean, Aristotle um, wrote about this in ancient times, uh, uh, his own kind of idea of how um, great literature, especially tragedy, uh, a, it allows us to experience that a catharsis of, of, of emotions. Um, and so someone like that understood this on those terms um, in ancient days. But cognitive scientists today are, are over and over their research is showing that when we read literary fiction, what is actually helping us is requiring us and therefore allowing us to practice the skills of interpretation and prediction and um, sort of, again, seeing the world through someone else's eyes in such a way that it, it's really not different. We're not using a different part of our brain than we use when we're actually talking to a real person. So if we are, so, and that there's, there's also a way in which um, because we are walking you know we're walking alongside a character or a narrator who's making these discoveries we're discover discovering along with them and there is we learn something more deeply and profoundly when we discover it rather than when we're just told it and so stories allow us to kind of go through that process of discovery like oh 
you know, it, you know, to again use Jane Eyre without giving any spoilers, but like, oh, sh oh, Jane, like Jane, it's so tempting to make this choice, but it's, is it the right one? Is it not? And we go along and, oh, it wasn't the right choice or, you know, and so that's a very different thing that happens internally um, to go through that process than to just be told, you know, don't you know, don't sin, don't do this, don't do that. Um, there's that added aspect of discovering it as we read along. I love that you just said that. I am a life coach and that's actually the whole basis of life coaching is that when people make their own discoveries, that's when transformation mm. and life change happens. Mm. It's not when people are told what to do, it's when they in their own heart, mind, spirit, decide and transform and heal or decide to move forward, whatever it is. So I love that you brought that up and that literature can be a vehicle for that is incredible to me. That literature can do the same thing that I do in life coaching. It's just a different medium to do that in. So, ah, I love that. I really want to talk about how can we read the, some of these classics with our kids when they maybe aren't as motivated, Like we, we may be really excited and th this will be so great and we've got that enthusiasm, but they may not. So is there a way that we can approach reading with our children that would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, I actually do think that a lot of people are ruined for classic literature when they're, you know, when they're forced to read it. And I mean, I do think that teacher, I do think that classics should be taught in school, but at the same time, um, I think, I think there are a lot of bad teachers or people who aren't teaching it well, and that's not good, or they, they're just, you know, I, there's, I, my husband's a public school teacher, so all sympathy to teachers, uh, because there's so much that they have to do, and whenever they have to do a new thing, they never take away the old thing, and so they just have to keep doing, so I, they have my sympathy, but, um, but sometimes, you know, this ends up turning people off of literature because they're reading things before they're ready or it's just a, a rushed thing. So I think at home, um, I mean, I, and this is a little bit controversial. Some people will not agree with me, but I think that some the abridged, you know, like the children's versions and the adolescent versions that, you know, the, the shortened abridged versions are wonderful ways to introduce students to classic works at their own level. One of my favorite novels of all time that I love is Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. I adore that story and I never, ever, ever tire of it. But the first time I read it was in eighth grade and it was an abridged version with pictures in it. You know, I mean, it's a pretty thick novel. I mean, it was most of the story, but it was, you know, slightly edited and it, that made me fall in love with it. And I will never forget falling in love with all of the characters and all the vivid pictures I have in my mind of my first introduction to those characters into that story. Um, and so I think there are a lot of ways that you can, you know, use those, those abridged versions or read out loud or read together and talk about it. And again, I think our, our very, you know, our, the speed of our lives um, makes us think we have to, you know, makes us choose uh, quantity over quality just choose quality. If it takes you six months or a year to get through a great novel, let it be. That's okay. Um, and just, just work on it and however much time it takes. And, and again, I, I, again, I, as I said before, um, choose something that's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, there, you know, we're all different and some things interest us more than others. And so there are so many good works out there that it, it's certainly possible to choose something that that holds your attention more than another thing. And our, and our, you know, we grow in our skills and our ability. And I, of course I'm a reader, so I have my own preferences and the kinds of literature that I like. And so I choose to challenge myself by reading, um, you know, C.S. Lewis, I think said, you know, for every, um, you know, three or four modern books you read, read an old one. Well, for me, it's the opposite. I like all the old ones. So I force myself to read the modern ones just to, <laughs> to grow and stretch. Um, and so, you know, eventually, of course, we can do that. But it's, it's just like reading is a skill that is really similar to physical exercise. The more you do it, you actually get better at it. Um, 
your skills improve, your comprehension and your attention span. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. You have to work at it. There's even a book about how to become a better reader. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called, but I remember um, a, a couple of people I know have read it and they said it actually really helped them as they you know, are trying to get through more books because they really want to, it's a value. So I thought that was interesting, but I can't remember what it's called. Maybe I'll try and find it. Well, what are you reading? That's one of the questions we have for you. What are you currently reading? Um, well, I'm always reading a lot of books because I'm either teaching or researching. So I'm, I'm doing some, you know, I'm reading some philosophy. And um, so what am I reading for fun right now? Um, um, for fun? Oh, I am reading um, Clara and the Sun by, um, by, by Ishiguro. I, I can't remember his name. I, I, he's one of my favorite authors and I can never, I never pronounce his <laughs> name correctly, but he wrote The Remains of the Day, which is another of my favorite uh, novels. So that's the one that I'm reading just for fun. Mm -hmm. It's his Great. new, his new release, Clara and the Sun. And it's quite, it's, it, he's a wonderful writer and it's a very imaginative book um, that's kind of blowing me away. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. And if you were to tell listeners, like these are three to five books that I love and recommend to everyone, what would those be? Okay, so my I have four favorite books. They're all classics, um, but they are, you know, I, I, over my entire lifetime of reading, these are the four that remain my favorites. I've already mentioned one. I've already mentioned a couple. So one is Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, which my new edition is just out. If anyone wants yeah. me, your introduction. Um, Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, which I'll be releasing next year. And then Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, um, which is the single book that changed my life the most back when I was in college and read it for the first time. So... Oh, how interesting. Okay. I love that. I, I want to dive into that, but maybe that'll be the next interview. <laughs> I would love to hear more about how it changed your life. Well, this, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on today. Do you have any just last words of encouragement for our listeners as they are looking at literature as an avenue for faith? Hmm. Well, I would just say, remember that God loves beauty because he is the source of all that's beautiful and his creation is beautiful and so to stop and to pause and make time for beauty is to honor god who created a world that is beautiful and so we have to get kind of past the hurry and the the things we have to do and and intentionally make time for beauty and so literature is, you know, well-written, good literature is uh, a form of beauty. And so, uh, you know, that I would encourage people to take time um, to read slowly and attentively and carefully. And remember that it's very, very different from that kind of fast reading that we do just to get information and to, to rem just be okay with the fact that it's challenging and hard and, and press on because the rewards are wonderful. It's mm, beautiful. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so Thank much you. for your, your words in the world. We are so thankful for them. Thank you. Goodbye.